everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and if you're listening for the first time, I'm the author of Unprocessed, the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, and if you'd like to find out more about my work, please go to www.eateatunprocessed.com. We have a very special guest tonight, not only one of my favorite people on the planet, definitely one of my favorite, if not tied for my favorite plant-based doctor, none other than Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn, Jr. He is the author of Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. He's one of the stars of the very popular documentary, Forks Over Knives, and he is the director of the Cardiovascular Prevention and Reversal Program at the prestigious Cleveland Clinic Wellness Institute. Dr. Esselstyn is an Olympic gold medal winner. He was awarded the Bronze Star for Service in Vietnam, and he was the first recipient of the Benjamin Spock Award for Compassion in Medicine. And I'm proud to say that he was the very first guest on the very first episode of the first season of my new TV show, Healthy Living with Chef AJ, and on a Another episode with Dr. Colin Campbell, my other favorite plant-based doctor, he actually taught him how to make breakfast. So please welcome to the show, Dr. Esselstyn. <laughs> AJ, thank you so much. What You're a delight. So- Oh, you have such a nice voice. You have such a I, – I, if, you, if you weren't a famous doctor, I think you would have been a great disc jockey, you know? <laughs> and, and, and what uh, I, I – listen, is Ann listening? Because can I say I love now, you? The last time I saw you was in, the, uh, in a tiny kitchen – in Long Island. Uh-huh. <laughs> I know. And, you know, Essie, you're so tall that when they were trying to shoot you, me, and Dr. Campbell, we, we they couldn't get the shot. You know, mm. I didn't realize how tall you are until till you're actually standing uh, standing next to you. You know, you probably don't remember this, but um, I'm going to remind you, and I think my listeners would enjoy this story. So we formally met it, July 17th. Uh, no, excuse me, June 17th, the day before Father's Day, 2009, where you and Ann and Rip came over for dinner. You were speaking at a conference in Los Angeles. But the February of that year, 2009, you were speaking at the Century City Hotel in Los Angeles for the A American College of Preven- ACPM, American College of Preventative Medicine. And you were one of the first lecturers in the morning, and you were speaking in front of all these doctors who were drinking coffee and eating danishes. And you were talking, you did that thing, and I'm going to ask you to do it, where you mention all the different vegetables, and you do it kind of quickly. And you said, and how many of you had kale for breakfast? And I'm in the back, and I raised my hand, and you said, well, I'd like to meet you, young lady. And I came up after the lecture, and we met. I don't know if you remember that, but it was, uh, it was the first time we met, and it was just, you were just so, I, I whoever dreamed that, like, one day I'd be working with you or be proud to call you my friend. But you really are responsible for, really, my family not eating oil, because even though I had been vegan for over 30 years, and I had McDougal's books, and I understood he said the fat you eat is the fat you wear, it wasn't until August 1st, 2008, where I saw one of your lectures, and the way you explained it was just, I really got it, you know, and I didn't have heart disease, I mean, my cholesterol has always been low, because I had been vegan so long, but you, you know, I, every word you say, it's like, I can, I, I hang on it. Heart disease is a toothless paper tiger that need never exist. And if it exists, it need never progress. The endothelial cells are the life jacket of the circulatory system. I mean, everything you say, I, I quote you because you really explained it scientifically why why oil is bad. And it's just one of the, the hardest points, I think, sometimes for people to get. But what I wanted to say to you about oil is, you know, you know my husband, Charles, and he's like a tall drink of water, just like you. And we had always eaten oil. We were vegan, but we had eaten oil. And when I heard this lecture you gave, the next day, we, this was August 1st, 2008, we just stopped oil. And I'm the main cook in the family. I'm the only cook. I make his breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I didn't even tell him because I didn't want him to freak out or worry that the food wasn't going to taste good. He didn't notice. But it's so funny because he was already slender, six feet tall and 160 pounds. And when we stopped oil, he lost 20 more pounds, not that he needed to. <laughs> but the funny part of the story is because I didn't see, he, he doesn't weigh himself. We didn't even have a scale but after about seven months being off oil he noticed that his belt didn't fit anymore he had to go several notches he he was worried he was sick he said oh my god I I don't understand I said don't worry we just stopped oil and and the weird thing is is he used to have this tumor a benign tumor about the size of a golf ball on his spine but because of the location they couldn't remove it and seven months after stopping oil this tumor disappeared and I'm thinking if oil's gonna if not eating oil is gonna shrink a benign tumor imagine and what it's doing for, you know, all these other diseases. So thank you for, you know, explaining so well why oil's bad, because we're going to probably have a few questions from the listeners about that tonight. And, and just your delivery, 
I remember this lecture, you used the phrase, we're like puppies in the tall grass. And I'd never heard that before. I said, any guy that puts puppy in his lecture, I'm going to listen to him. So, so thank you for just being such so charming and so inspirational. You know, you're, you're just, you're awesome. And, and every, we love you. So, you know, before we get into the questions, is there anything you want to talk about, like what you're up to and what you're, what you're passionate about, or, you know, this is, this is your hour, Dr. Eskelson. Well, I think that you have to tell me if, uh, if it would be appropriate to just take your audience through uh, once again, the uh, the sort of the basics. That is, if there's some if there's some people in the audience who aren't aware of how it is that uh, cardiovascular disease is created, uh, we can take just a few minutes on that. It's your I call. Think, I think that would be great because even though <clears> I think <throat> that the people listening tonight probably are familiar with your work, <clears throat> we never know who's going to listen to it once it's on YouTube <clears throat> or iTunes. So please tell tell us. Well, sometimes repetition is the mother of skill. Absolutely. And the, I think the, the consensus among experts in this disease is where cardiovascular disease has its very inception is when we progressively uh, injure the life jacket and the guardian of our blood vessels, which is that single layer of cells that lines the innermost part of our artery. That's called the endothelium. And the endothelium makes an absolutely magic molecule of gas, nitric oxide, well, which is truly our great protector, and it has a number of absolutely key functions. One, it keeps all the cellular elements in our bloodstream flowing like Teflon rather than Velcro. It keeps the cellular elements from ever getting sticky. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest vasodilator in the body. That is to say, when you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, they widen, they dilate the arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate, that's nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide maintains the wall of the artery soft. It keeps them from getting stiff, inflamed, or thickened, protects us from high blood pressure. And number four, and this is absolutely key, an adequate safe amount of nitric oxide prevents you from ever developing blockages or plaque. So literally, anyone on the planet who has cardiovascular disease, has their disease because they have so sufficiently trashed and injured the capacity of their endothelial cells to make nitric oxide. They simply do not have enough to protect themselves from developing the disease. Now, this is really strikingly confirmed most recently by autopsy study of young women and men between the ages of 17 and 34 who have died of accidents, homicides, and suicides. Mm. And now the disease is ubiquitous. So you graduate from high school, you get a diploma, and you also get the foundation for heart disease. <laughs> not enough not <laughs> enough for your cardiac event yet, but if you keep eating the same way, yeah. and progressively, by the time you get to your late 40s and 50s, 60s, we now begin to see those clinical cardiac uh, events. So... That's really sort of the, uh, the the basic and the background. And what we found out and what we adhere to is we try now that we understand what are these foods that every time they pass our lips, we absolutely decimate and injure the capacity of the endothelial cell to make nitric oxide. They are, one, oil. Yep. Olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in bread, oil in a salad dressing. Oil mm -hmm. injures the endothelial cells, as does anything with a mother or a face, meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, and dairy. Milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, yogurt, and coffee with caffeine. Mm -hmm. Caffeine's okay with tea, but not coffee with caffeine. And Interesting. Go easy on the sugar, maple syrup, molasses, and honey. Mm -hmm. So you're going to eat those marvelous whole grains for your cereal, bread, and pasta, 101 different types of legumes and beans and some potatoes, and the red, yellow, and especially the green leafy vegetables and some fruit. Could you list the green leafy vegetables? Because I love when you do your little ditty. Bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens, napa cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus. Oh, love it. Thank you. <laughs> There's so okay. many to eat. Yeah. 
Well, that's pretty- now. All right. Let me just say a reason why we so strongly emphasize, especially with patients who have chest pain or angina with their heart disease. Why we? I'm I'm such a hammer on the green leafy vegetables because. If you could get your head inside the artery and you could actually see the plaque, you would see that it is an absolute oxidative cauldron of inflammation. So for rapid and successful healing, I need antioxidants. No, do not go down to the health food store and buy a jug of pills that says antioxidant. doesn't work. It's going to be harmful. I want you to get your antioxidants through food, okay? What food? Food that is high in what we call ORAC value, O-R-A-C, oxygen radical absorptive capacity. So that means that raspberries, blueberries, and strawberries on your cereal, wonderful. But nothing, nothing, nothing can trump the green leafy vegetable. Yep. So I need to have those patients who are crippled with heart disease, and especially with angina, six times a day, I want them to chew, not a smoothie, not juicing. I want them to chew a green leafy vegetable roughly the size of their fist after it has been cooked, five and a half to six minutes. If it's spinach, you don't have to cook it. Mm-hmm. But then you anoint it with several drops of delightful lemon or balsamic vinegar, so you've mm-hmm. got an absolute t- tender taste treat. Delicious. I and, you'll cons- and you'll chew this at breakfast. You'll do it again as a mid-morning snack, again with your lunch and sandwich, again mid-afternoon, obviously at dinner time. And, God, I adore it when you have that evening snack. Kale. <laughs> what have you done? All day long, you have been basking and you have been bathing that oxidative cauldron of inflammation that is blocking your artery with nature's most powerful antioxidant. And it is absolutely wonderful to see how rapidly these patients begin to ameliorate their uh, their symptoms of angina. Mm. But isn't it just easier to take a pill? <laughs> I'm playing yeah, it's, yeah, it's easier to take a pill. That is yeah. correct. It, it's yeah. easier I, I, to take being, a pill. isn't going to work, right. but you can I'm, take a pill. I'm being facetious, of course, because mm-hmm. Dr. Russelson, why? You see, what, 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 what we're striving for here is to restore, really, the basic covenant of trust that has existed since the days of Hippocrates uh, between the caregiver and the uh, patient, and that is Wherever possible, the caregiver is going to share with the patient what is the causation of the illness. And sadly today, in our most leading killer, cardiovascular disease, that is not done. We Mm. resort to drugs which have nothing to do with the causation of the disease. We resort to stents and procedures which have enormous expense, enormous morbidity, and significant mortality, and do nothing to treat the causation of the disease. So sadly today, Cardiovascular medicine is positioned with this leading killer of women and men, and they cannot cure patients. Number two, they will, this, this approach will never end the epidemic. And in this most wealthy of nations, uh, it, it is really financially unsustainable. And it is an absolute mistaken belief for physicians or anyone else to say that patients will not make this significant lifestyle change. It's not that the message is wrong. Mm-hmm. It is really how the message is articulated. Right. Well, sometimes they don't even know. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, I speak to a lot of people like cardiologists, and I'll try to give them your book, and they're like, oh, well, my patients won't do it. And I'm like, well, did you ever ask them? Uh, no. <laughs> you know, but, you, you know, do, do you fight, do you get frustrated that your colleagues are just not wanting to hear this message? It seems like almost too simple to be true. No, but I tell you, well, sure, I mean, th- for 30 years of this, but, well, I'll be honest. The reason that I uh, am so uh, really excited, perhaps even now more so with the potential of medicine than ever before, is that <clears throat> when you think of where we were 30 years ago, if, there, if you thought there was <laughs> resistance now, you can imagine what it was like then. Oh, I, but oh wow, yeah. It's, uh, it's so absolutely exciting to see some of the younger cardiologists coming by, wanting to apprentice with us. When we see uh, others uh, pick up and start this in other parts in the country, 
And it's so exciting when you see a cardiologist come to you when they've had a heart attack. It's really sort of uh, exciting. But what really, I think, is crystallized many of us more than you can imagine is the fact that the president-elect of the American College of Cardiology, Kim a, Williams, wonderful, a wonderful right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, wonderful a cardiologist from Rush Presbyterian Hospital in Chicago, Kim Williams, has uh, last July when he was elected, pre- when he was president-elect, made it very clear that he himself was a plant-based in his nutrition. He had seen the results in a patient of his, and there was at one time a statement attributed to him that his really one of his goals was to try to put is especially out of business. And I thought that was that was just tremendous. And I have a feeling that with his leadership, uh, more cardiologists than before will perhaps get a chance to at least hear the message and have an opportunity to have their eyes opened as to how effective this can be and how simple it can be and how safe it can be. That's fantastic. I'll be I'll be speaking at Baxter Montgomery, who we just had on the show, another plant based cardiologist at a symposium. I can't wait to meet him. He sounds fabulous. So, how did you get? You know, because you were a surgeon, a traditional surgeon, you were cutting things off and up. And so, how did you particularly get so interested in heart disease as opposed to say like cancer or diabetes? What what made you focus specifically on heart disease? Well, <clears throat> the when I returned from uh, Vietnam, where I'd been a combat surgeon, I was offered a position uh, on the staff at the Cleveland Clinic in 1969 in the, uh, <clears throat> as a general surgeon. And in a few more years, I was chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force, and I was uh, director of, the, of <clears throat> thyroid and parathyroid surgery. But it was in my role as chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force, that I became progressively disillusioned about the fact that for no matter how many women I was doing breast surgery, uh, I was doing absolutely nothing for the next unsuspecting victim. Mm -hmm. And that led to a sort of a a global uh, review. And it was truly quite striking to see in other cultures, such as Kenya, where breast cancer was 30 to 40 times less frequent than the United States. And in rural Japan in the 1950s, it was very infrequently identified. And yet as soon as the Japanese women would migrate to the United States by the second and third generation, still pure Japanese American, they now had the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart. And perhaps even more powerful was the cancer of the prostate information from Japan. For example, in 1958, how many autopsy-proven deaths were there in the entire nation of Japan that were attributed to cancer of the prostate? Eighteen. Eighteen in the entire nation of Japan. By 1978, 20 years later, they were up to 137, which was still paled in comparison to the 28,000 who will die uh, this year in this country from cancer of the prostate. So it was about this time that I I guess I got a little bit concerned or disillusioned that perhaps my bones would long be dust before they, I could really they get better any not. A- answers between nutrition and, and cancer. Although in hindsight, I'm not sure that's correct. But nevertheless, it was my thought at that point to say maybe I really should be going after the leading killer of women and men in Western civilization, namely heart disease, because here a number of cultures which I was encountered in this review uh, really that were by culture, heritage, and tradition, they were plant-based. Cardiovascular disease was virtually non-existent in these millions of people. Yeah. For instance, the rural, the rural Chinese uh, the Papua Highlanders in New Guinea, Central Africa, the Tarahumara Indians in northern Mexico. And so <clears throat> at that point, I thought, gee, the way to <clears throat> perhaps get at cancer is through heart disease because if people start eating to really save themselves from heart disease, 
will also have an opportunity to diminish the common Western cancers of breast, <clears throat> prostate, colon, and yeah. pancreatic. And so uh, at this point, uh, the, the challenge really became, uh, I knew I was going to do this, but I was absolutely smack up against uh, behavioral modification uh, in myself because I felt that I had to do this myself for a year before I could really ever start a program with patients. Oh. For instance, I had been, grown up on an Aberdeen Angus and a, and a dairy farm, <laughs> and I was a, co- a confirmed cholesterol holic. Wow. So did you but, yourself have high cholesterol or heart disease before? No, I'm, it, you, my cholesterol and resting left ran about 180, 185. Oh. Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing is once uh, I, uh, I sat sort of mulling over all this information, but I hadn't quite started. And then I, in hindsight, I now understand why it took so long. Because as you know, with pa- behavioral modification, you usually go through a number of phases that have been very well defined by Dr. Prochaska from Rhode Island. And you have this pre-contemplation, and then you get into contemplation, and then you get finally to action, and then you get to maintenance. Mm-hmm. And I, I can remember the absolute day that the I had this epiphany, and it was at a uh, surgical meeting that I was attending with my wife Anne in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. It was in April of 1984, and the meeting was, uh, it was oh God, it was the papers were so dull and boring. And the <clears throat> weather was just terrible. But they always have a banquet at the end of these conferences and meetings. And on that <clears throat> evening, the waitress put a plate of roast beef in front of me that had a uh, a portion that was literally, it was just draped over the sides of the oh, plate. Boy. And I just looked at that and I thought, you know, I'm, this is it. I'm, wow. I'm not doing it. So Anne looked at me and said, uh, you're not going to eat your roast beef? I said, no, <laughs> this, this is it. She said, well, then I'll have it. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. So, I see her saying that. Uh, then uh, uh, it was interesting because uh, Anne's mother had died at age 53 of metastatic cancer of the breast. And two weeks after that meeting in New Haven, her sister came with breast cancer. And that was when she looked at me and she said, okay. I'm with you. And that's so it was in April of 1984 that I had my last meal of any meat. And uh, then I went full bore and my cholesterol plummeted to 150. And then I finally said, oh my God, I'm, I've got to stop the oil. So I stopped uh-huh. the oil. And the next time I had it checked, it was 119. Wow. No, no drugs, no statins, yeah. just. Just uh, eating the good old plant-based diet without any oil. That's incredible. So then I went to cardiology and asked them if they would uh, be willing to supply me 24 patients, provide me with, uh, I didn't didn't want these people to be exactly at death's door, but they were in (laughs) truth, as my late brother-in-law say, these were Essie's walking dead. Wow. There were 24 of these people. they had either failed their first or second bypass. They had failed their first or second angioplasty or stent. They were too sick for these procedures, or they had refused. And <clears throat> five were told by their expert cardiologists they would not live out the year. But I'm happy to say that those five all made it beyond 20 years, and That's it was really quite exciting. That's amazing. To, to suddenly uh, see how... Uh, these patients responded. Now, I was absolutely petrified, not being a <clears throat> trained psychologist. Uh, I was petrified about the the loss because it was a small group. I mean, I, ha- I had all my surgical obligations, and so I only could have one half day off for research. And if they didn't comply, uh, this was going to be the rock upon which this study would flounder. And so I decided to use for these uh, patients who were so sick uh, with heart disease, the same mantra that I was using for my cancer patients, which I had learned many years ago from a wonderful West Coast surgeon by the name of Bert Dunphy. 
And Bert used to say that patients with cancer are not afraid to suffer, and patients with cancer are not afraid to die. But patients with cancer are afraid of being abandoned by their mm-hmm. family, by their family, or by their physician. So the first five years, <clears throat> I saw every one of these patients every two weeks in the office, went over every morsel they ate, checked their cholesterol, blood pressure, and weight. And at the end of five years, <clears throat> I was able to stretch it out uh, to once a month. And by the end of a decade, they were now pretty well on autopilot. So uh, I was doing it quarterly. And that the results on that have been uh, published on several occasions, and really it was, we've had some extremely striking reversal of disease on an angiogram, but I think it's very important to share with your audience uh, this evening that although that, there are actually six types of disease reversal. Now, the one that's sort of jazzy and exciting are when you see the, uh, the disease regress in the artery itself. But that's only one way that they deserve disease reverses, and that's going to happen perhaps in patients whose plaque happens to be soft, made up of inflammation, fat, and uh, and cholesterol. On the other hand, there are going to be patients who are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s whose plaque has been there so long, it's absolutely nothing but solid scar and calcification and fibrosis. And it's just never going to really regress and go away. And yet, the thing that is so striking is that though even those patients will have absolutely remarkable uh, regression of their illness elsewhere that will result <clears throat> in their being able also to return to full activities without uh, restriction. We recently had a gentleman who had previously had some stents. He was from Oklahoma City, an antique dealer. And he had had those stents, and then he went in, in uh, December of 2013. Uh, he was feeling miserable again with angina. Had another angiogram, which again showed exactly what I said. Two of his blood vessels, his right coronary artery circumflex, were totally occluded, and his left anterior descending by 80%. So I said the only thing they could do for him was a bypass, which he absolutely refused. In January of 2014, he found our book, and he began following the program. But uh, he, that the book was 2007, and it was only in the last four years that we had the green leafy vegetables. So when he called me for some suggestions and thoughts, in January of 2014, I suggested that he come and attend my monthly intensive counseling seminar for patients with cardiovascular disease, but he was afraid because of his health status to travel from Oklahoma to Cleveland. So I said, all right, and then in the meantime, why don't you do this as assiduously as you can, and what you're not doing is the green leafy vegetables six times a day. So he picked up on that, and then we kept in touch maybe every two or three weeks, and this (laughs) angina, we kept getting better, Mm -hmm. kept getting better, kept getting better until finally by April he said, I'm coming to your seminar in May, which he did. So he had five and a half hours more of our intense uh, um, seminar, and he really was uh, was moving very well. And then recent, then this December of two, December, excuse me, in September of 2014, I happened to be in Aspen, <clears throat> uh, Colorado, making a presentation when Somebody came up to me and said, do you know Mr. So-and-so from Oklahoma City? I said, sure, I do. You have it? Yes. Why do you know him? He said, well, he couldn't get here today, but he wanted me to tell you that he's been out here in the Rocky Mountains for the last three weeks hiking. <laughs> <laughs> so in nine months, a man who was absolutely crippled, and of course, those 100% blocked arteries are never going to open up, but what, <clears throat> but what does happen and it's worth explaining to your audience, is that when somebody as forcibly as this fellow does this, you have to take a moment and use your imagination and think of the heart with no muscle in it at all. It'll just be an absolute uh, piece of tissue looking at the heart, but what it is is the thousands and thousands and thousands of interconnecting blood vessels, which 
although only at the very top do they have this degree of blockage. Throughout the rest of the entire cascade of the coronary tree, there is no plaque, plaque disease, but there is plenty of other disease. Let me explain. So when you have somebody like the patient that I've just mentioned, and you think of that blood vessel, all those vessels, there, the angi- excuse me, the endothelium, and its bil- ability to make this wonderful nitric oxide, has been brutally compromised. And now he no longer is injuring the endothelium, and he's taking all these green leafy vegetables, which are working against that oxidative cauldron of inflammation, the plaque. But there's one thing that I haven't told you, and this is going to be new, new to all of you tonight. And that is that <clears throat> by now you've gotten the, the idea that the endothelium is your guardian in your life jacket. Mm-hmm. Well, it is to a point. But once you have been so mean to it, and once it is absolutely beaten down with those patients having this severe, severe angina, the endothelium, believe it or not, is now making two molecules that absolutely injure you. And that is they manufacture endothelin, E-N-D-O-T-H-E-L-I-N, endothelin and thromboxane. Now, what do those do? Those simply are, they're not plaque, those molecules are vasoconstricted, doing the absolute antithesis of what the endothelium does when it's healthy and making nitric oxide. So when you take a gentleman like this antique dealer from Oklahoma City who had such severe angina, and you make these profound nutritional changes, that entire coronary vascular tree that doesn't have plaque, but that is nevertheless is so severely injured, it will stop making the vasoconstrictor, and it starts making the vasodilator. And so you have this absolute double whammy of how you can turn this uh, around. It is so incredibly powerful. Uh, And it's so exciting for these patients because what you have done is you, you have empowered them to be the locus of control to destroy this hideous disease that was taking them out. That's amazing. Are you in, are you in touch with any of these people from the original study? Are any of them still alive? Uh, there are some that are still alive, but that we started that. <laughs> some of them now are in their twenty eighth twenty eighth year. No, I I'm not. No, I just there's just so much going on. I did, but when I wrote just when I went back when I wrote the book, I was in touch with many of them again, and it was quite striking. But some of them. Uh, now that they've reached 90, some of them have died. Yes, I, I, I cannot make them eternal. Oh. Well, I wish, I wish we could make you eternal because one of my concerns is who's going to fill your shoes. You know, Dr. McDougall was able to produce another Dr. McDougall, Craig, and Dr. Campbell produced another uh, Dr. Well, Campbell. Well, you forgot that I produced a fireman. <laughs> <laughs> He's saving lives too. So, so as we've got about forty questions. So, what we could do is, I know that <clears throat> probably talk at length on all of them. What I could do is, I could read them, and you can give quick answers. Or if there's one that you really want to go off on a tangent on, you can. But I'd like to, if it's okay, would you get to some of the listeners' questions, if that's all right? Oh yeah, no, I didn't. I'm sorry, I apologize no, to your listeners. I, I didn't mean to. No, uh, no, no. Roll on and on I, like this, but I, uh, I, I was just suddenly dawned on me that I bet they're not familiar no, this with the cool. endothelin and thromboxane. No, that we, I love what you did because people will re-listen to this. This is so important, and we love what you did, and that's why I wanted to give you the opportunity to speak first. And this is just gravy that they get their questions answered, you know. So, so <laughs> I'll I try. I'm not sure I'll succeed. <laughs> I've, I've limited them to the ones on heart disease because some of them we got about other general body parts, and I thought that would be more appropriate for another doctor. So a lot of them will be just quick yes-no answers probably. So it, um, Barbara wants to know that if you have a family history of coronary artery disease and peripheral artery disease, would you ever recommend a full-body scan? Well, you know, if somebody simply has a strong history of cardiovascular disease, first of all, I, one comment about peripheral artery disease, it's very, very infrequent, other than in a diabetic, that you will have disease in the legs in somebody who has not had a history of smoking. So mm-hmm. it's terribly important. Uh, I mean, in our intensive counseling seminar, I do not accept patients 
who are smoking. Of the course. Ex smokers, yes, but the reason we don't we do not accept smokers is no matter how carefully they eat, if you're smoking, it's history. It's yeah. not gonna work. It's not gonna work. So if you have a strong family history the exciting thing today, if we're talking to somebody now, before they have developed full blown cardiovascular disease, now they're gonna certainly protect themselves from ever having this problem. But the same, interestingly enough, goes for somebody who has a strong family history, but now let's suppose that they've had uh, a situation where all male males in the family have been dead before the age of 50 because of heart disease. Mm-hmm. And this, and let's say the patient has somebody who's in their 30s who's had a heart attack, but they've survived, and they just feel the sword of Damocles hanging over their head. Uh, nothing could be further than the truth than the fact that they are going to be absolutely fine if they really do this and do it right. And they're going to be so empowered to know that even though they have that, you know, perhaps that genetic burden, mm-hmm. especially what we know now with epigenetics and, and our own history of over 30 years, I don't care if the patient's got a strong family history. If they're willing to do this and make these changes, <clears throat> they're going to do fine. That's fantastic. Suzanne wants to, we, we'd already talked about oil and not, we, you don't recommend it for anybody. Uh, Suzanne wants to know if someone with diabetes should cut out all fats, including nuts, seeds, and avocados, or should people in general cut those out? How do you feel about the whole food fats? Well, I think that whether, if somebody has cardiovascular disease, whether they have diabetes or not, I'm not a great fan for nuts. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I don't mind seeds if, if you have, some seeds that are some sesame seeds that happen to be impregnated in a few spots on the outside of a bun that you're eating. That's I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna, Listen, I'm, I'm a not, chef and I don't impregnate my food with anything. Let me just tell you. I'm that. not going to quibble on that. But if I give the green light for nuts and uh, and uh, and seeds and avocado, that's just a lot too much more fat than I would want for certainly for my patients. For example, uh, Right now, we've in the situation we have, we've got a winner. And if if I ever said somebody could ever have you know four or five English walnuts on their cereal in the morning, that's not what people would hear. Right. They'd say that Dr. Esselstyn said that nuts were fine. Well, that's crazy. Did you ever hear of anybody who ate one nut? Uh, no. <laughs> nuts are highly addicting. If they I are- ever said nuts were fine, then all this saturated fat would be pouring down at, at, at whenever they would be nuts in the glove compartment. There would be nuts in the living room, nuts in the bathroom, nuts in the kitchen, nuts in the bedroom. I mean, it would just be a torrent. Now, on the other hand, if somebody doesn't have any cardiovascular disease and their cholesterol without medication mm-hmm. is under 150 and they're able to eat a few nuts and an avocado, and still have those great numbers. I don't have a problem with that. Sure. <clears throat> but if they're uh, eating those, if they don't have heart disease, but their cholesterol is higher, and they're eating those foods, then I would be a, a somewhat troubled. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Me, uh, I have to ask this because it's so cute. <clears throat> Mary wants to know if you still eat all those peanut butter cups on New Year's Eve. <laughs> no, i the family. The family has absolutely brought down the. <laughs> they still give me. Uh, in my stocking, they still give me that, but I, the most I think I've had in recent years was one or two. Oh, <laughs> you, you're so good at it. You're so good. Um, that that and, and she also wanted to know if you have any plans to retire. I hope not. Well, you know, Colin Campbell and I have uh, have tossed that back and forth with each other, and uh, uh, the idea of retiring really is not on the horizon right now because, Thank quite, frank, quite frankly, uh, the um, – I guess I feel that we in medicine are tr- truly on the cusp of what could be a seismic revolution in the health of this nation. Now, by that I mean the, the seismic revolution that I'm talking about is never going to come about with the invention of another pill, nor is it going to come about with the invention of another procedure or an operation. But the seismic revolution will come about when the when the schools of medicine in this country really suddenly begin to rep, recognize that long overdue 
is the responsibility of our profession to share with the patient and the public what is the lifestyle and most important of all, the nutritional literacy that will empower them to become the locus of control to halt and reverse and eliminate these common chronic killing diseases that need never ever exist, such as heart disease and stroke and obesity and diabetes and hypertension. For instance, let's talk at this for a moment about hypertension. Here you are, you're now 20 years old, you've gone through high school, you don't have nice, you're, you're feeling fine, your blood pressure's okay, but now you're 25, you get a checkup, oh, it's creeping up a little bit now, the blood pressure's 130 over 85, now you're still okay, but now you're 35, now your blood pressure is 145, you know, over 90, and you start taking your first pill. Now you're 45, and you've picked up a few pounds, your blood sugar's going up a little bit, now your doctor says you probably better take another pill for hypertension. Well, this is just crazy, and it's just thinking, lousy, horrible medicine that's being practiced. Somehow we've got to show people why it is that they've developed this hypertension, why it is that they've developed this type 2 diet. I had a fellow just tonight <clears throat> who actually, uh, up until the time he had his heart attack uh, in 2013, he had had 30, he was 68 years old, he had 30 years of type 2 diabetes. And he was on the usual diabetic medications. And he tumbled into our book and started our study. And <laughs> within nine months, his diabetes had disappeared and he was no longer taking any medication. Now, why is it, why is it that, we, that patients can learn to do that out of a book without even seeing us? And why can't some endocrinologist take all these patients with diabetes and say, listen, guys, while we do have all these interesting medications, it would be better if the majority of you just got rid of your diabetes. And that is that is such an incredible, very powerful. And what's so exciting about it is you're not spending the, the king's ransom on any medication. As a matter of fact, you are getting rid of medication. What are you doing? You're eating food. What right. food? Food that is safe and doesn't injure you. There's no horrible side effects. Yeah. There's no expense. How can you beat that? But the dignity of simplicity is what we have to offer, and it is incredibly powerful, but it's a tough sell. I love that, the dignity. I love that. You're such a wordsmith, the dignity of simplicity. I love the things you say. You know, one time, and I, I teach a weight loss program, and not, people don't always comply. And I remember you had a great saying. You said something like, inappropriate execution of the method is no excuse for its abandonment. You and almost I, got it right. Uh, it's what is it? In, inappropriate, inappropriate application of the method is no excuse for its abandonment. I love that. And, and the other thing that I learned from you is, you can your your dad said you can always tell the greatness of a man by what bothers him something like that. Yeah. You, you you have such great things. So so this I, I actually I get this question a lot, Doctor Russellson. So I'm glad that a couple people asked this next question. Danielle said that on your website in the FAQ section you explain that smoothies. What's FAQ? Oh, frequently asked questions. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> and and by the way, if you're listening and want to get in touch mm. with Dr. Esselstyn and maybe take his wonderful one-day program, his website is his name, Dr. Esselstyn, D-R-E-S-S-E-L-S-T-Y-N.com. She says that you explain that smoothies create inflammation, so not to have them. But then wants to know why then is it okay to say puree of ve vegetables for a soup or freeze bananas in a Yonana's machine for ice cream? So I get that a lot. Like, what's the difference between a smoothie and, and like, you know, the frozen banana ice cream or soup, because it's all kind of being changed a little bit. Well, uh, the you've heard me express my interest in how important it is to have green leafy vegetables. Yep, six times a day. And uh, and I want them chewed, because there's, there is data to show how much more healthy chewing is than just glogging it down or swallowing it. I want people to chew their food, and I want them to drink water, or they can have tea with with caffeine, but mm -hmm. no 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 diet sodas or anything like that. But mm -hmm. now the smoothie. Uh, when people grind up the smoothie, that is to say, they say bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens. When you grind those up, throw them in a smoothie. That's pretty tart. And they don't like that tartness. So have to add invari foods. invariably people are going to add a, an orange or a banana or an apple. Now, I don't have a problem with your eating an apple 
are eating an orange because they're the fructose is so bound so bound to the fiber that the absorption is slow throughout its gastrointestinal transit. On the other hand, once you take and put these things through a blender or a high-speed machine, now you've separated <coughs> the fructose uh, from the fiber, and it's just like a rocket going off in your stomach. I mean, I've, I've had some of the patients who didn't believe me who checked their blood sugar uh, when they chewed it versus when they let it go with a smoothie. The difference was like something between 90 if they chewed it versus 300 <laughs> when they blended it. That's very interesting. So with that sugar just absolutely roaring through your stomach, it injures the liver, glycates protein, and then injures the endothelial cell. So this is why I have a great difficulty with that. I mean, fruit is fine if you chew it slowly, but, uh, boy, I never have apple juice or orange juice. Yeah, and I, we'll have to change that. I think some point in our book, Way right. back in 2007, we did have some apple juice. So, do people I have hope to, that do people answers have your to, questions. No, thank you. You really explained it well. Do people have to worry about how much fruit they eat as far as their triglycerides? Well, I think, if, I think if you just, you know, you want to keep a dry eye on your triglycerides because fruit is mostly sugar. Mm-hmm. And I think increasingly if you compare fruits to vegetables, and every study, vegetables will really, uh, <laughs> they're the champ. And yet, and yet, I, I, and yet, I, I have no problem with you having, uh, you know, having an orange or having an apple. But right. I don't think you have to have sixteen oranges. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Could somebody ask what you thought of the eighty ten ten diet, which is a very. very I think it's the eighty eighty ten ten is fine. But 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 not but but raw. But isn't eighty ten ten too much fruit? I mean, that's my understanding of it when they're doing it. The well, way. I think what we're uh, when we're talking about there is eighty <clears> percent <throat> carbohydrate. Right. right? 10% and, protein, 10% fat. Right, that, mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, we have two people. It's interesting. We we have two people that wrote in the same question but are having opposite results. One person said she's following your diet and has lost too much weight and, ha, and has been recommended that she should eat some of the fats like nuts and seeds. And another lady wrote in and said she's gained 20 pounds eating this way from all the starch. So how do you, how do you address that? I mean, how, how could two people? Well, have, you, what you do is you, you talk to them individually because obviously uh, – they're at different ends of the spectrum, mm-hmm. and they have um, a situation which calls for really uh, individualizing. Now, let's take, for instance, first the person who has uh, has uh, lost more weight than they want. Well, when we ask people to no longer have oil, no longer have dairy, no longer have meat, we've taken away an enormous amount of those high caloric foods. And so really people who do that right invariably will lose weight. Now, <clears throat> for the person who feels that they've lost more weight than they want, we want them to increase their calories, but they don't have to eat it by resorting back to the foods that are high. In the, in the for instance, if somebody with heart disease wanted to go back to eating more nuts and avocado, I would, I would just discourage that. But what we would like them to do would be to in, take – and increase uh, their their high the high caloric density food and what we're suggesting here there are the grains so there would be for instance suppose somebody weren't to, were to have an extra bowl of cereal either in the afternoon and in the evening after supper uh, in that bowl of cereal if you have rolled oats if you have oat milk if you have raisins banana for sweetener, maybe uh, blueberries, raspberries, and strawberries. You've got a delicious caloric feast of things that are absolutely healthy. And you do that uh, a couple of extra times a day. Or if you want, maybe a new snack with some bagels with some hummus that is free of oil or tahini. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there are just ways of increasing the grain intake to keep the weight loss from happening. Now, on the other hand, addressing somebody who finds that <clears throat> there's a weight issue, it's almost impossible uh, to gain weight on the program that we suggest uh, unless somebody is really overdoing the high caloric density food, the grains. Oh. The first thing that we would suggest in that person was that they would eliminate the grain that is made from, uh, that is flour. Mm-hmm. So that means that when you take a grain and you enrich it into flour, 
as my friend Neil Barnard has pointed out, you've got something much closer and akin to sugar. So the pasta, bread, rolls, and bagels are gone. And then you eat sparingly of the other grains, and weight is going to come down. And for that person who is gaining weight, be sure that the only thing that they ever drink is water and never any smoothies or juice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's going to work. And if that doesn't work, then we'd uh, fine-tune it a little more. There are occasional patients where we really want to see their weight come down rapidly because let's say that they've, they have a fragile amount of heart disease. They uh, somehow tell you that uh, they seem to weigh about 270 pounds and they're diabetic. And they just, you know, they hit a plateau in their weight loss at 240 when they <clears throat> you get them to stop the flour. And then there's a, a little technique that I first heard about from the National Institutes of Aging, which is really rather safe uh, because it's only twice a week, <clears throat> and that's fasting on Monday and Thursday so you don't interfere with the uh, weekends. Mm-hmm. And when you fast on Monday and Thursday with water only, although in in the special situations I would not be at all adverse on the, even on their fasting days if they wanted to have the green leafy mm-hmm. vegetable, vegetables. Nobody sure. ever going to gain a lot of weight eating green leafy vegetables. Right, but right. Those, yeah. those are the those are some of the suggestions that. Uh, that we would think about for those situations. Sure. We, we had Dr. Clapper talk a little bit about this intermittent fasting. Well, you know, you, I believe you're the one that said, Dr. Esselstyn, that we didn't exit our mother's wombs clutching a Vitamix. And so I'm, I'm just playing a little bit devil's advocate here. If the Vitamix, if the sharp blades of the Vitamix are bad for the fruit, why then aren't they also bad from the grain? I mean, why would we want to disrupt a whole grain and make things like flour? It, I, I mean, it, doesn't that make it a little bit more injurious? Well, I suppose you could argue that <clears throat> that is the case, but I think that if we're going to get people to really uh, continue to have the health of grains, that um, I think the way it's constituted in breads that are made without oil mm-hmm. and without sugar and in whole grain pasta and uh, some of these uh, cereals like rolled oats, I... Uh, I think those are I think those are safe. Yeah, I, rolled oats I love, and I love the way you make them, which is raw. They're so much more delicious raw than they are cooked, in my opinion. <laughs> so we have. Um, I'm going to combine many questions because a lot of them have to do with cholesterol. A lot of people are saying, "Do you recommend statins for people eating this way mm. if their cholesterol is over 150, even if their LDL is low?" And so mm. your full thought. I mean, is just eating this diet enough? Or do we have to worry if if our if our numbers are not? I, and I believe I heard you say once to be heart attack proof, you're supposed to be something like under 150 milligrams per deciliter for total cholesterol and under 80 milligrams per deciliter for LDL, something like that. Well, uh, when I wrote the book in 2007, uh, yeah, that was maybe. And now in hindsight, I was just a little bit uh, harsh or a little tough, and I'll and I'll explain. Uh, <clears throat> now, it's it's not really a number. No no number that I know of has ever caused heart disease. What causes heart disease is what is passing through your lips every day, uh-huh. and has the and has the capacity to injure the endothelial cell barrier that binds the inside of our artery. Now, recently not recently, actually, in the last several years, when I again reviewed the data from the Tarahumara Indians who never have heart disease, when you look carefully, while the average cholesterol in most of them is about 135, there are going to be some Tarahumara Indians who are carrying numbers, you know, 180, 190, and 125, 130 for their LDL, but no heart disease. And... I've also, over the last 30 years, followed persons who were very close to me who didn't uh, ever take any statin drugs, but were eating, I just knew, they were eating as carefully as I was. And at no time did their cholesterol really get much below 170, usually bouncing between 180 and 190. Mm -hmm. And I have no fear that they're going to ever have heart disease. Why? Because at no time have they injured 
the magnificent endothelial uh, barrier that is the great protector of their vessel. And so if they do happen to have a few extra molecules of cholesterol that is made, as you know, only by their liver because they're not eating any. So if their liver happens to be making a few extra molecules of cholesterol, uh, I have great confidence that the endothelial cell barrier of their vessel is so strong that that's not going to have to be uh, an issue. But I think that before I can say that, I really would want to know within with intense detail about somebody who says, well, uh, I I don't take any cholesterol-lowering medication. My cholesterol is around 180. But where do they find out how often do they eat out? When yeah. they eat out, what do they say to the waiter? Do they actually turn in their chair, take off their glasses, look them in the eye and say, I am deathly allergic uh. to a single drop of any oil. Yeah, exactly. And or do they do they just sort of fluff it off and go on and uh, and you know because a lot of people if they eat out twice twice during the week and then of course the, on they're always off on the weekends that's four days out of a <laughs> out of a week that means that those or there are two hundred days out of three sixty five that they're still trashing and injuring their endothelial cells so when somebody is going to have a cholesterol that's a little bit elevated like that. You want to be absolutely sure, first of all, that they're they are letter perfect, so that they are not in any way, at any time, injuring their endothelial lining. Now, as far as it's, no, it is not mandatory for heaven's sakes to take statin drugs. Some of our most dramatic evidence of disease reversal has occurred uh, with patients who absolutely uh, either refused a statin or had tried it, and they just were so sick from it. They couldn't get up off the floor. They had so much neuromuscular pain, or they had, they found that their memory went uh, foggy when they were taking it, and so forth. But they don't despair. Those these patients can absolutely do beautifully, uh, even if they couldn't take <clears throat> a statin drug. Look, do you think for one minute that the Tarahumara Indians in northern Mexico are thriving on statin drugs? <gasps> absolutely not. According <clears throat> to you, they're selling pencils or something like that, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. Uh, it's just I can't believe how this 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 hour has just flown. We could we we have to have you back. And I apologize to those whose questions didn't get answered. We're going to be having cardiologist, plant based cardiologist, Dr. Joel Kahn in a couple weeks, and I'm sure he can answer those questions and resubmit them. But before I let you go, Dr. Esselstyn, I want to announce to all our listeners for the first time today that we have decided to take a year off from Healthy Taste of LA. We've produced 13 events in the last five years, and we're taking a little rest. But we're coming back even bigger next year, and we have a date. It's Martin Luther King Jr. birthday weekend, January 16th and 17th of 2016. We're having well, AJ, AJ, listen, congratulations on the work that you do. Well, thank the, you. The, con- the contributions you've been making. And thank you for having me as your guest. Wait, wait, don't go. Essie, don't go. i got to say one more thing, okay? Yep. Yeah, because what, what I didn't say to the people is who the keynote speaker is. And the keynote speaker is none other than Dr. Esselstyn. And we can't hear them, but I know they're jumping up and down in, the, in their seats. And it's not just Dr. Esselstyn, but we're <clears> having the whole family. We're having daughter Jane, wife Anne. And when you come, you're going to be able to hear me sing this song, Esselstyn's. Meet the Esselstyn's <laughs> skinny family oh, too much. from oh. the town of Cleveland. You will not believe how much they eat. Someday, maybe they will eat some nuts. And then, just like me, they'll have big butts. Esselstyn's, meet the Esselstyn's. Well, you really got to see them. You'd want to be them. You'll have a real good time. So please join us for Healthy Taste of L.A. next year with keynote speaker Dr. Esselstyn. It has been such a pleasure talking to you, and I can't wait to see you, I hope, very, very soon. And love to your whole family, and thank you so much for what you do, Dr. Esselstyn. All right, listen, get a good sleep. Okay, good night. (laughs) And thank you so much for listening to everybody. You've been listening to Healthy Living with Chef AJ. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious.